Our next speaker is Anya Ermakova, who's speaking on 5-MeO DMT containing plants, fact or fiction. And Anya has a motley background and varied research interests, including nature conservation, ethnobotany, neuroscience and psychiatry, and interweaving and connecting these diverse paths through psychedelic science. Anya worked at the forefront of psychedelic research as a science officer at the Beckley Foundation and has provided psychedelic welfare and harm reduction services with PsychCare UK and Zendo, which is part of MAPS in the US. A deep love for nature and wildlife has motivated Anya to study biology at the University of Edinburgh, and a quest to understand altered states of consciousness prompted her to specialise in neuroscience and later pursue a PhD in psychiatry at Cambridge, where she investigated the origins of psychosis. She then worked for the National Health Service, developing and trialling a new psychosocial intervention for psychosis. After a brief stint as a clinical trial manager, she decided to pursue her passion for nature by studying conservation science at Imperial College London. She is currently working as a research consultant in London, but stays involved in peyote conservation work in the USA. She is a part of Chakruna's Council for the Protection of Sacred Plants and a board member of the Cactus Conservation Institute. Welcome, Anya. Thank you very much, Ronnie, for introduction. So as Ronnie mentioned, uh, some disclosures. Um, so I am affiliated with Chakruna Institute and Cactus Conservation Institute. And I'm also a researcher at King College London. And uh, uh, I work with the Beckley SciTech, which is developing 5 mu dmt assisted psychotherapy for uh, treatment-resistant depression. And it's uh, through my work with Beckley that I became very much interested in 5 mu dmt and uh, started to do more and more research on this compound and uh, look into all sorts of other things. Uh, my main work is a, a clinical neuroscience, uh, psychiatry and psychologist. So uh, please bear with me if I uh, mess up something to do with botany or chemistry. And uh, of course, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. But yeah, as I said, um, I'm uh, I know a lot more about neuroscience, uh, but I love botany, I love conservation biology as well. So what is 5-MeO-DMT and where is it found? 5-MeO-DMT uh, is a short-acting psychedelic tryptamine. It's uh, found in many plants and some animals. Uh, it has a unique subjective effect profile. It's very short-acting. Um, usually taken in the smoked or form uh, or insufflated and uh, it's incredibly intense. So uh, what most people describe as 5-MeO-DMT is uh, uh, whiteout, ego dissolution, void and uh, yeah, it's incredibly intense experience. Uh, currently, 5-MeO-DMT is in clinical development for depression, for alcohol use disorder, and there are trials uh, ongoing in the uh, UK, where, where I work, uh, also in the Netherlands, and uh, soon would probably be all, all over the world. And I know there is a trial in Australia coming soon. 5-MeO-DMT uh, was synthesized in 1936, and it was... Uh, uh, first isolated from a plant, uh, Dictyoloma incanescens, in uh, 1959. And uh, uh, later that same year, uh, it was identified in several snuffs from South America. And subsequently, it's been found in a very large number of plants in small quantities. And in 1967, it was discovered in gland secretions of uh, uh, Buffal virus toad. And uh, here you can see this uh, majestic amphibian um, who has the highest concentration uh, uh, in its uh, uh, gland uh, secretions. Uh, this toad is called Sonoran Desert Toad, and uh, it contains uh, um, by the estimates the range goes from 5 to 30% 5-methoxy-DMT uh, in its um, secretions, which are often called toad venom, but it's not really a venom. 
Uh, 500 DMT was also uh, found in uh, mammals used endogenously, and uh, it was found in rats, specifically in the uh, neonatal rats, on particular uh, in certain days after their birth. And uh, there was a lot of variation in 5 amino DMT between individual rats. And it was found in their brain. Uh, 5 amino uh, DMT has been found uh, endogenously in some studies with the people as well. Uh, but just as a word of caution, a lot of those studies were done in the 60s and uh, 70s, it was during this quest to find psychotoxins, so something that causes schizophrenia. Uh, so a lot of trials were comparing uh, healthy people with people with mental health problems, uh, trying to find this uh, uh, toxin and 5 amino dmt and popotanin and DMT were some of those candidates. 5 amino dmt was uh, detected in urine, blood, and cerebrospinal fluid in some patients and some healthy volunteers, uh, but it is was not consistent. There was a lot of variability, and also the methods in those trial in those studies left much to be desired. And uh, so we don't know if there is uh, five amino and what role it has. Five amino DMT has been uh, found in uh, fungi. Uh, uh, its presence was confirmed in at least two species, Amanita citrina and Amanita porphyria. Uh, both of these belong to the genus Amanita, uh, and uh, both of these uh, mushrooms are fairly common. Uh, Amanita citrina is known as a false death cup, and I strongly recommend you don't seek this mushroom out because it uh, can be confused with a very little uh, death cup. And now I'm going to the main main topic uh, uh, of my talk, 5 uh, amino in plants. Uh, the three genera that are most uh, commonly associated with 5 amino DMT are uh, probably Virola, Anadenanthera, and Phalaris, and those would be mostly, uh, but there are a lot, a lot more uh, less known plants that I'm going to zoom through during this talk. The seeds and occasionally um, bark uh, of uh, Anadenanthera form the basis of antigenic snuffs that were formerly consumed over a large portion of South America. And you can see in Anadenanthera there are two two species and four subspecies. And I apologize for this busy slide that's more for reference. It's not something for you to worry about. It just shows an overview of various uh, tryptamines that were found uh, in this uh, species uh, with the references. And you can see that 5-amino-DMT, uh, uh, well, there is a lot of variability, of course, depending on the uh, part of the plant, whether it's in seed, in the bark, or in snuff samples. And uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of variability. I'll go into more detail for each species later. Uh, uh, indigenous cultures used and still use 5 amino DMT containing plants for ceremonial and spiritual purposes. And there are some amazing. Um, uh, uh, archaeological uh, monuments uh, and depictions showing Anadenanthera. For example, this uh, style of sculptures from Shavin uh, depicting supernatural figure adorned with the uh, vilka leaves and pods. And uh, a lot of it is described in a great book by uh, Constantino Torres and David Repke, which I highly recommend if you are interested in archaeology in particular. Uh, archaeological evidence shows uh, Anadenanthera uh, have been used as uh, uh, hallucinogens for thousands of years. And the, the oldest clear evidence of use comes from pipes made of puma ball found with the uh, Anadenanthera colubrina beans uh, in uh, uh, in Argentina, 
and the pipes were found to contain the DMT and 5 meo DMT. And radiocarbon uh, dating uh, uh, dates it to 2100 BC. So there is at least 4,000 years of, uh, of of its use. There were also snuff trays and tubes that were found in uh, in Peru uh, and uh, in Atacama Desert in Chile. And uh, uh, later Andean cultures, for example, Vari, uh, added ad anodinanta receipts to beer, producing mildly psychedelic uh, beers, I mean, mildly compared to snuff, but they still had effects. And uh, the hypothesis is that um, some some ingredients in those beers uh, had uh, uh, some monoamine oxidase inhibitors that that made it orally active. So something something in those beers suppressed those enzymes that break down uh, five in the DMT and the DMT and other tryptamine. So the the first. Uh, species um, I want to introduce is Anodonanthra colubrina that has two subspecies and uh, it's the tree itself and the snuffs that are made from it are called Kurupao, Vilka, Sibyl, depending depending on the on the locality. Um, they have uh, uh, medicinal, uh, th these trees have medicinal use and they're also harvested for wood and for tannins. As, uh, plant material can be smoked and also used in enemas. And the main active constituent of vilcus snuffs and preparations is bufotenin up to 12%. And there is actually either no 5 meo dmt or very little. Uh, trace amounts of it. Uh, Anodonanthera peregrina is called Yopo, Cohoba, Parica, or uh, Calcium tree. It has also two varieties. Uh, variety Falcata is native to uh, Cerrado vegetation uh, biome uh, in Brazil and Paraguay. And the wood uh, uh, is very valued for its timber and used in making furniture. Uh, Anodonanthera an peregrina variety peregrina is native to Guyana, Venezuela, Brazil, Colombia, and is also found in the Caribbean. And this is mostly used for antigenic snuffs. Uh, uh, Europeans first encountered uh, snuff preparations from this plant in the island of uh, Hispaniola uh, in 1496. And sometimes uh, snuffs, snuffs are called cojobo, yopo, uh, curuba, acuya, parica, and they're usually prepared by the tribes around Orinoco Basin. Uh, the seeds of the yopo tree were originally gathered from the wild, uh, but over the years they've been cultivated and transported elsewhere, expanding plants' distribution through introduction to areas beyond its original range. There is also some uh, evidence of the use of uh, these snuffs with the uh, Venisteriopsis capi, which is a component of ayahuasca, but not as a drink. Uh, uh, there are some some indigenous people, for example, Piero of Venezuela, chew and eat the bark of Venisteriopsis capi before and then take the snuffs to potentiate its effects. So in summary for uh, the Nantara, snuffs are made from uh, uh, seeds and have been used across uh, South America for thousands of years. 5-MeO-DMT was found in some of those snuffs, but mostly it's bufotenin. Uh, now moving on to the next genus called Virola, which is a medium-sized trees, again native to South American rainforest. 
and closely related to uh, nutmeg. Uh, species are known commonly as Epena uh, or Kumala. Uh, they have a pungent odor and they have dark green leaves and small yellow flowers. Uh, there are about 67 Virola species. A lot of them contain uh, various tryptamines. You uh, can see here. So those are the species where 5 methoxy DMT has been identified. And many of those uh, species are used by indigenous people in the Amazon region and generally across the Americas as well, in Central Americas too. And uh, they are used uh, for antigenic reasons, they are prepared as snuffs, as smoking mixtures, as even oral pellets, although there is a questionable whether they were oral or sublingual pellets, most likely sublingual. And uh, depending on the uh, on the indigenous people, there are different ways the snuffs were used. For example, uh, sometimes uh, they are used only by the medicine men uh, for divination or to find out for for uh, medicine. Sometimes they are used by all men over a certain age. Sometimes they are even given to the dogs to enhance their hunting ability. So really there's a lot of variety there. And uh, other than the theogenic purposes, virolas can uh, are valued for their uh, wood again. And uh, the nuts uh, of some of virola species uh, have a lot of oil that can be used in candles or for, for, for the light. And there is even one virola species that's, that grows in Mexico that's used as a flavoring for chocolate. There's an interesting indigenous uh, group, uh, Yanomami. They use both virola and uh, anadenantara snuffs. Um, and they also use virola uh, resin as an arrow and dart poison to, when hunting to immobilize animals. And uh, dart poison made from the uh, sap of uh, virola uh, yields up to 8% 5-amino DMT in, in one analysis. So, And there is also an excellent book, uh, the, the Fallen Sky, that, that I have here that I recommend you to read if you want to learn about this interesting uh, culture and their struggles nowadays. Uh, this is one of the example of virola species. And uh, as I was, uh, this is the red sap uh, that has probably the highest amount of 5 million DMT of all uh, three parts. This is the fruit that's very nutritious, very oily, and uh, a lot of birds and animals like to eat it. And disperse it across across the forest. Uh, so in summary, virolas are much more promising as a source of 5-amino DMT, particularly the bark resin. And there are a couple of species that so far in, in the tests show higher concentration of 5-amino DMT. Uh, next, moving on to phalaris, uh, which are grasses. Uh, there are four species uh, where uh, 5 amino DMT has been found, uh, has been confirmed, uh, although there are probably a lot more species with 5 amino DMT. They just haven't been tested yet. Uh, Polaris aquatica is a, a common name is harding grass or canary grass. Um, it's a, a perennial grass that's native to Mediterranean, but introduced as a forage crop all over the world. Very common, often invasive weed. 
as many uh, many varieties and many hybrids and it's a very quick growing grass uh, another phalaris grass phalaris uh, arandinacea red canary grass uh, also has worldwide distribution also in some places considered invasive and uh, like the previous phalaris has huge variation in alkaloids between strains times of uh, harvest uh, it also has uh, uh, toxic alkaloid gramine and again there are <coughs> certain strains uh, that are uh, rumored to be rich in 5 mu dmt Phalaris is uh, known mostly for its association with a disease in cattle called staggers. And uh, if if uh, Phalaris is causing this uh, disease, so why, why is it so common as a forage? So normally uh, for mo most of the year, Phalaris provides high quality, high biomass forage for livestock. And this grass is very tolerant of uh, drought of uh, flooding uh, and of heavy grazing. Uh, also during extended dry periods, um, phalaris can persist because it has very deep root system and the uh, formation uh, of buds at the base of tillers support regeneration and regrowth. In addition, uh, no major plant diseases affect phalaris, so it would have been an excellent forage if not, if not for this uh, phalaris toxicity that manifests in the in the stagger syndrome, which uh, has head tremors, loss of coordination, collapse, and uh, other forms of toxicity are cardiac or neurological sudden death. Uh, staggers can be prevented by administering cobalt, and there is lack of comprehensive understanding of the cause of different manifestations of phalaris toxicity. Uh, and over the several decades that uh, staggers have been studied, nobody still managed to identify what what exactly causes it. And uh, it was 5 amino DMT, DMT, beta carbolins, hordenin, gramine, high levels of nitrogen are suspects, but nothing is exactly exactly confirmed. And also relevant to Australia, there have been reports of kangaroos grazing on Phalaris uh, aquatica and who also develop staggers. Just to show you how variable um, uh, the alkaloids, here is a recent study also from, uh, from South Australia about the concentration of uh, 5 mu DMT, DMT, and gramine over the growing season from uh, from the sites, like from from certain fields where staggers were found. So you can see how uh, there is change in concentration of 5 mu DMT, how it's higher in earlier in the year, and then it it drops until uh, in July, it's very, very low, both in leaves and stems. And it's slightly different with, uh, with DMT, where it goes up and down throughout the years, uh, throughout the year. And again, the authors and looking at other literature, nobody knows exactly what, uh, what affects the level of alkaloids. Yeah, just just to summarize, it again. This there is high variability in alkaloid concentration, even within the same strains, and there is a huge variation between different strains and different species. Uh, then we have um, uh, chiliponga or chagropanga. 
And in parts of Ecuador, it's confusingly known as Chacruna. Uh, this is a climbing shrub native to Amazon. It's very common ayahuasca mixture. And uh, there is a common misconception that it contains 5-MeO-DMT, but in fact, it doesn't. Or if it does, it has it only in, in trace amount in stems. And there are many, many, many other plants uh, that uh, have uh, tentatively, um, that have 5-methoxy-DMT uh, tentatively identifying them. And it's usually based uh, on not peer-reviewed uh, data, but on independent researchers taking initiative and using thin layer chromatography and color reaction tests. Uh, many of these assays were done more than 20 years ago. And a lot of it you can find in these excellent sources of information by uh, Kipper Trout and uh, uh, Snow. And this is where I got most of my information for the subsequent slides in terms of alkaloid concentration. Um, in the acacia, uh, the next uh, genus is acacias, and I'm using this word in the uh, wider sense because there's actually five different uh, genera that contain what used to be called acacia. Uh, now, acacia, acacia in a strict sense mostly includes Australian uh, wattles. Uh, most acacia species contain uh, tryptamine or phenethylamine alkaloids, or many, not most. In particular, many contain DMT. And uh, a lot of uh, people are keep discovering new and new species that contain uh, this. So this is a list of uh, uh, five amino DMT containing acacias. Again, we don't have exact uh, numbers. That was just tentative identifications. Uh, this is an excellent resource that was uh, done by Intergenesis Astralis team about um, uh, harm reduction in terms of harvesting, uh, wild harvesting acacias um, for DMT. And I think similar things would apply for 5-amino DMT if it's discovered that it's feasible to extract it. Just yeah, make sure we don't do any, any harm. Uh, moving on to the next um, genus. Uh, there is um, Delosperma, which is a group of succulents native to South and East Africa. Uh, again, several uh, species have been tentatively identified to contain uh, 5-amino DMT. And again, those were assays done by uh, John Appleseed in mid-90s and reported in Trout's uh, book, uh, Some Simple Tryptamines. Uh, one example from this genus uh, is Delosperma cooperi. It's a, a small perennial plant um, from South Africa. It has this beautiful, beautiful bright pink flowers. And uh, uh, this plant is used in preparation of uh, hadti, an alcoholic beverage like a beer. Um, and uh, plants... Uh, on, on the root of these plants, there are certain species of yeast and uh, uh, bacteria and fungi that uh, are involved in brewing. And moving on to next genus is uh, Mimosa. Uh, three, three species possibly identified as containing 5 amino dmt uh, One of them is... Um, uh, sensitive plant or touch me not and it's a really cool plant whose leaves uh, when you touch them they they fold um, defending themselves from harm it also falls the leaves at night it's uh, very often used in botany as a model organism to study um, memory and circadian rhythms uh, this plant used for phytoremediation 
contains alkaloid uh, mimosine, uh, used in medicine to inhibit toxicity of cobra venom and scorpion stings, and has has all sorts of other uses. Okay, and now moving on to other plants. There are about 25 of them, so I'm just going to go very, very quickly in the next 10 minutes or so through, through these plants. Uh, the, the first, uh, and they go in alphabetical order, so I just leave them. One is giant cane or giant reed. Um, its features in Greek mythology has been known for for a very long time. Uh, it's uh, 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 in in Greek mythology, uh, Pan was said to have made the first pan pipes from the uh, nymph uh, Syrinx he was chasing, uh, who changed herself into this plant. Uh, leaves and roots of this plant are edible. It's used as a biomass crop. It's used for wastewater treatment. Canes are used for all sorts of things. Um, in ancient Egypt, um, uh, the dead were wrapped in the leaves. And uh, also reeds are very common material for all sorts of uh, wind instruments. Uh, interestingly, the Rarica people uh, of Mexico make arrows and staffs before peyote pilgrimage from that particular plant too. And it's considered invasive in Oceania and North America. Another plant containing 5 mbo DMT is uh, rescue grass, native to Venezuela and South America, introduced worldwide now. Uh, it's uh, not really much re remarkable about it. It's a very, very common plant. Uh, then we have uh, Cezalpinia uh, with uh, two plants uh, called Bird of uh, Paradise. It's a large evergreen shrub native to South America, prized as ornamental plant. And it um, has many medicinal uses, uh, but it has um, uh, the seeds of it are very toxic, and they're so toxic that that one and uh, and Zalpinia pulcherima uh, were used um, to cause abortions and also for suicides. But they are very beautiful and they're grown for ornamental purposes. Uh, another plant containing 5-MeO-DMT uh, is uh, Comptonella, or oh, another genus, and it has two plants that uh, were discovered to have 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, both of them are native to New Caledonia, and they are shrubs and trees. And there was at least one anecdotal report uh, of uh, uh, decoction of these leaves uh, to have uh, the psychedelic effects, uh, where the leaves were just boiled with uh, with lemon juice for for fi five hours, and the, the liquid was ingested, and it produces it produced psych psychedelic effects. Uh, then we have uh, the smodium species uh, called tick trefoil or tick clover or beggar lies. Uh, Dictyoloma uh, incanescence, or what it's called now, uh, Dictyoloma uh, vandellianum. Uh, it's a shrub that grows in South America, and it's the first plant from which 5-MeO-DMT uh, has been isolated in 1959. There is not much in the botanical information about it, but again, there are anecdotal reports 
of psychoactivity after smoking uh, the leaves um, and uh, possibly root bark would also be active. However, there is variation between different plants. Um, so there is a lot of research needed to be done to understand if there is 5-amino DMT and what, what is, if it is, what, what varieties and what times of the year is better to harvest, what conditions, etc. Uh, we have another plant called telegraph plant, uh, which can move its leaves. It can move those two little leaves very fast that help to orient, to orient the bigger leaf towards towards the sun. Uh, it has ornamental and medicinal value and it has um, reports of 5 amino DMT. Uh, that one is a very interesting plant. It's a uh, Pelodium uh, colchellum. Why it's spread in Asia and Australia. It's very important plant in Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine. It has one of the highest amount of 5 amino DMT among plants, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 5 amino DMT of the whole plant. And um, in addition to 5 amino DMT, it has uh, various beta carbolins as well, not harmin and harmalin, but more, more exotic ones. So it's kind of two in one. It has uh, both 5 amino DMT and beta carbolins. And uh, studying rats uh, confirm uh, monoamine oxidase inhibit inactivity, and they also um, uh, lack of toxicity of this plant. No plant preparations. And again, we have anecdotal evidence of, of psychoactivity from bioassays. Uh, another grass, um, very, very common worldwide, uh, used to be cultivated in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's called Polish millet. The, the, the dish is called Polish millet. And this, this grass produces high amounts of grain and it's very heat uh, and uh, drought resistant, very good for grazing. Of course, Felde, uh, cabbage leaf nutmeg found in Sumatra, Malaysia, Singapore, used in traditional herbal medicine. Uh, we have uh, Hugonia, another plant from New Caledonia. And again, all these plants that I go very fast, they just have traces of 5 amino DMT, and we don't have even the figures of how much there are. Uh, this is an interesting plant um, used as medicine and for food, and also several indigenous group, uh, groups in Peruvian Amazon use the bark of the tree to make uh, pellets for oral consumption in a similar way that the pellets were made from virola plants. Uh, Lespedeza, a shrubby bush clover or uh, bicolor Lespedeza, native to Asia, but uh, grows worldwide. It's very common ornamental plant, has has been bred in a number of cultivars. Uh, we have a, a velvet bean, which is notorious for its nettle-like itchiness um, uh, when touching seed pods. Uh, seeds have been used as an aphrodisiac in a variety of places, like in, in uh, Indian medicine, uh, in Mexico, and, and other places. And seeds are fam uh, have a very high uh, amount of uh, levodopa, uh, which is a drug used to treat uh, useful in Parkinson's disease. 
Uh, there are also reports of psychedelic effects from smoking leaves, particularly when combined with monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And unlike seeds, leaves don't have L-DOPA. There's another plant, um, wavy yellow marble leaf, native to Java. Uh, then we have uh, Pilocarpus, uh, Pilocarpus uh, posiflorus, um, has a fairly high percent of 5-MeO DMT and supposedly it doesn't contain pilocarpine, which is a toxic um, uh, agon uh, uh, a toxic chemical that uh, is also medicine for glaucoma. Uh, it's a uh, uh, pilocarpine is a muscarinic uh, acetylcholine receptor agonist, and uh, it's uh, uh, taken a lot of it can result in heart failure and cardiovascular problems. Uh, there is a plant that's very similar to Anadenanthera, uh, grows in Atlantic rain rainforest. Then we have another grass, and uh, this tree from uh, west coast of United States, California bay laurel or Oregon myrtle, uh, that had a lot of uh, medicinal uh, uses and also found to have um, 5 meo DMT in, in stem bark. So, I, I managed to do it in 45 minutes to just whiz through all those plants. Uh, so in conclusion, I would like to say that we need to do a lot more systematic assays of the species um, that uh, I mentioned and other related ones. Uh, we see that alkaloid content varies within the same species, depending on time of the year, environmental conditions. And I guess there is... Uh, Hardly anyone gets 5-MeO-DMT from plants. Synthetic and uh, toad-derived are much, much more common. And yeah, the reasons for for that are what, what I uh, mentioned. Okay, th thank you very much. And if you have any questions, send me an email or I'm looking forward to questions now. Thank you so much, Anya. That was a fascinating uh, presentation and so much information in there. I, I learned a whole bunch of stuff and I look forward to going back over the slides later. Uh, there's so much in there. At, th at the moment, um, we haven't got any questions coming up here, but so if anybody out there has any questions, now's the time to type them in and Anya will answer your questions for you. We'll stand by for a moment in case somebody does that. Here we go. Okay, we've got our first question, Anya, and the question is, do people actually extract 5-MeO-DMT from these plants, or is the extraction uh, too difficult or require a lot of expertise? Uh, the answer is yes, they do, uh, but it's not very common. So uh, if you uh, go to forums like DMT Nexus and 5 meo forums and reddits, you can uh, see people describing the results of their experiments with extraction. And uh, there was talk, I believe, by Julian uh, uh, Palmer at a conference a couple of years ago where he described uh, that it was actually very easy to extract 5-MeO-DMT from um, uh, one of the plants. Let me show you which one. Yeah, so um, he extracted 5-MeO-DMT incandescence and uh, said that it was very easy to extract very, using similar methods that DMT from Mimosa. 
So that I know people extracted uh, five amino DMT from Polaris grasses as well. Great. Uh, we've got another couple of questions that have come in. The next question is, what are the most important harm reduction tips for 5-MeO-DMT? Uh, harm reduction teams, tips in terms of uh, the consumption of it or in terms of plants and the toads? I guess uh, in terms of understanding uh, any harm that might come from using some of these plants, are there any particular uh, tips or advice you can give for tri uh, traps people need to watch out for if they're going to try and extract their 5-MeO and use it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So very, very important to remember that it's not just 5-MeO-DMT in, in many of those plants. So uh, you would extract a bunch of alkaloids and you can also end up um, looking at plants that can contain very toxic um, things like pilocarpine, for example, or some of the other alkaloids, uh, some of the things in acacias can be quite dangerous. So it's very important before doing any extraction is to research the plant and find out what else is, can be found there and to make sure that uh, if you do extraction is, uh, is not going to be 5 meo and something else that's potentially dangerous. That's one harm reduction tip. Another harm reduction tip that's for the plants themselves is to do no harm. Again, to research the plant, to research if plant is potentially endangered or threatened. Of the plants that I listed, um, none of them are particularly endangered, and actually many of them are invasive. Uh, but yeah, for example, if you go for certain plants, always make sure that it's uh, not going to be harmful for the environment. And then we have another question here. How do you envision the future of 5-MeO-DMT? Will it become a medicine? Will it be a synthetic product? Well, in, the, in the clinical trials and then later on, if clinical trials are successful and it does become a medicine, then it will be a synthetic product. Like what, what happens with all medicalization of psychedelics and clinical trials, it's so much easier to, to work with synthetic product because you know exactly the dose, you know the purity. It's a lot easier to get all the approvals in place. So yeah, for, for clinical use, it's going to be synthetic. But in terms of broader landscape, uh, if you look beyond medical use, if you go for um, see what's happening in the US with the criminalization and possibly changes in legislation, um, then I think we'll have a variety of, oh, it, not, not just synthetic. Thanks, Anya. The next question is, uh, and he says, I think you said bufotenine was a major component of some of the plants and snuffs. Would you like to comment at all about its psychoactivity? Well, there is uh, uh, this debate about whether bufotenine is uh, psychoactive or not. I know Sasha Shulgin uh, uh, writes that it it's not psychoactive. Jonathan Ott writes that it is psychoactive. Um, and uh, again, if you look at uh, earlier research trials that were done, I think in the late 50s, 60s, some of them show that it's not psychoactive, but has some, some physiological effects. Uh, if you look at forums, some people report that it is psychoactive, so uh, yeah, I guess uh, there is no uh, easy answer, but again in Anadanantara, the, the main the, the main component in those snuffs is bufotenin, so I, I think it, it would be psychoactive. Thanks, Anya. 
And that but seems maybe to be... there's a particular method of administration that, that needs to happen for it to be effective. Thank you. That uh, seems to be all of our questions, and we're almost out of time. It looks like you've explained it all. So thank you so much, Anya. It's been wonderful to have you here at EGA 2022 and uh, lots of interesting information for us to, to sift through later on. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ron. It's always such a pleasure. It's my second year at the uh, Garden States and uh, yeah, always amazing to, to learn and share knowledge. Thank you.